Fun fact, I've just discovered that if I accidentally put my camera the wrong way round, you can see me in the, in the reflection of the oven. <laughs> Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome to my channel. Uh, today, um, I wanted to talk about Ruth Ezeki's The Book of Form and Emptiness. So, um, this has been shortlisted for the Women's Prize. This is a book that I kept on hearing about a bit at the end of last year when it came out. Um, and up until now, I had not read any Ruth Ezeki. So this is something that I feel like I want to change, especially with, um, I think, The Tale for the Time Being, I think it's called. A Tale for the Time Being. Um, I, I really want to check out anyhow. So, um, yeah, I'm going to be talking a little bit about it, going into a bit of detail about some parts of the plot later. So there will be some spoiler warnings later. Um, but I'm going to talk a bit more generally about the book first before I go into that bit, so I'll announce when it all happens. Um, but the book of Form and Emptiness largely is dealing with several different um, sort of thematic points um, throughout the book. So we've not only got a character um, in Benny who is a young man who is hearing voices, um, and so there's a lot in this book about dealing with sort of the mental health system, I guess, um, let's say in terms of various people's perceptions of what it means for him to be hearing voices. Um, you know, that's something that in previous times, you know, would, would have been seen as potentially a religious thing. You know, people hearing voices would have been been championed as sort of being in connection with religion and with, with a God or a spiritual being. Um, but in sort of recent times is sort of seen as sort of mental ill health. And so there is a lot that this book sort of deals with in terms of that, in terms of Benny kind of going through the system and the, the kind of conflicts around him, particularly around that. And this all sort of springs from the fact that, and this is not a spoiler because we know this right from the beginning, that his father has recently died or he's sort of looking back rather on the death of his father. And um, as part of that, you know, you can sort of see how some of the, the mental health services are drawing a straight line between the two things and suggesting that it's all linked. Um, on the other side, we've got his mother, who is not only sort of struggling to to deal with, with looking after him and, and sort of particularly his sort of fairly erratic mood swings based on what he's hearing and not hearing, but his mother is also potentially about to be laid off in her job um, and her job sort of very directly works with books. She is sort of the last vestige, um, almost of, you know, the last kind of the old guard of dealing with print books and dealing with them at a time when um, everything else is sort of going digital in her department. And so she's potentially losing her job because she works in the area that is largely around that. And then added into that as well, we have this sort of over overall theme around animism and the idea that 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 um, objects that we see as inanimate have um, sort of their own lives and souls or spirits in some form, um, and so this is tied in with a very, I mean, it's it's not subtle that it's linked to Maria Kondo, um, sort of famous for you know the joy of tidying up and. Um, and, and all of her sort of series about the idea of sparking joy and all of this kind of thing, which has sort of become a really big kind of pop culture moment of everybody sort of knowing about this. But a key thing in her, um, her approach, let's say, to tidying is about the idea that individual being, uh, individual items have sort of experiences and, and spirits in some form. Um, and so we kind of can wake them up or when we, you know, discard an item or give it away, we thank it first. Um, and this ties in very uh, strongly with a lot of other things happening in the book. So not only that books are directly the ones telling stories and that humans are the conduits and sort of vehicles for them to be able to tell stories, but also that um, these sort of animist principles tie into some other things around, for example, hoarding. Um, so the mother has sort of various issues around hoarding. And so we see how those things are meant to interconnect. Um, and again, I realise that a lot of this sounds like spoilers. A lot of this happens very, very early into the book. So, uh, you know, will be on the blurb. But the book kind of tries to sort of address all of these themes sort of all at once. This idea that um, if, if, if individual items have lives and they can speak, is it, it's not potentially crazy, um, you know, to use the, the language that lots of characters in the book refer to, to Benny as, as being... 
it's not sort of crazy f to, to acknowledge those voices and to be part of them. And so there's this really sort of interesting, almost East versus West in terms of um, how, the, how, how we approach life and various things. So the idea that if, if we have a thought process that individual items have lives and they're important, we not only value them, but it's maybe not too wild to talk to them. But if we adopt more of a, a mindset that they are just things, then actually accumulating them in a sort of very sort of late stage capitalist kind of consumerist way um, is different. You know, we're not necessarily appreciating them quite as much and, and that sort of ties in. So anyway, that's a sort of broad overview of what this book um, is about. It's quite a long one. I think it's about sort of 500 or 500 and a bit pages. Um, and I will say at times I did wonder if it was a tiny bit long in the sense that I think maybe a little bit could have been cut to sort of streamline some of it. But it does build through this sort of, you know, this sort of long story of following this, this sort of young boy's life and this sort of father, uh, sorry, mother, son relationship to sort of see how they navigate some of these, um, these things along the way. Um, and with that said, I'm going to go a little bit into some spoiler territory. Cool. So some, uh, I'm about to go into spoilers. So, you know, please do feel free to, to click off if you need, if you want to kind of go and read the book. Uh, so essentially a lot of this, like I mentioned, has a, a lot to do with Benny and his mental health. And he starts sort of, it, it starts becoming more and more of a problem, um, around him. Less so in his own head. He seems fairly comfortable at first, it, well, eventually he becomes a bit more comfortable with voices. Um, that's largely um, because he sort of makes peace with it to some degree, but everyone around him seems to really have an issue with it. And particularly the kind of, you know, he starts skipping school and he starts doing all these other things that, that seem to problematize that, um, you know, that he's then seen as a, a problem child. He's seen as, um, you know, having these delusions, but actually in, in the sort of, thought process and the sort of philosophy, I guess, of something like animism, where the idea is, you know, that items have lives and, and spirits, then actually it's not seen as particularly kind of out there. But this then sort of throws up some other potential questions because he goes to a mental health care facility and while he's there, he meets other people who, some of whom seem to share his, um, uh, the same sort of thing that he has in terms of hearing these voices and being able to communicate almost with items, but also how it interacts with how we maybe diagnose other people. So there are a few people in there who yeah, maybe hear things the same way that he does, but also some people who are in there for different reasons. And it, it, I suppose, I mean, I, I at least got the sense that Ruth Ezeki's Part of Ruth Ozeki's inten intention with this book is potentially to also question what we deem as mad in, in a society that's potentially ill itself. So actually hoarding is, is one that comes up and I mentioned a bit earlier. Um, his mother's hoarding is seen as um, uh, a sort of an issue that's sort of internal at first. You know, we're, lots of people around her see this as her being at fault. And there is a lot around, you know, I have some personal family experience with hoarding and it's, it's really difficult because it, it's, it's a really strongly held belief for, or set of patterns um, for people. But what I think was quite interesting is how it explores that hoarding is both something that is to do with the individual's psyche and, and sort of um, well-being in that perhaps there's a, a, a need to feel like they need to defend themselves and sort of, you know, build security by having lots of things around them, um, you know, to always be ready for anything that might come up. And that feels like a reaction to some kind of trauma almost, or some kind of insecurity or deeply held fear. But, on, but by the same token, the book also asks the question about whether this is a problem more generally with Western um, consumerism. Like if, if we see consumerism as uh, the sort of the necessary thing that we sort of in a very hollow way go and buy loads of things to make ourselves feel better, then actually this culture is, 
you know, it's almost a nature versus nurture debate, right? That feels very much like the nurture aspect. The society around us is telling us we need things. It's telling us that we'll be better and more secure if we have more things. And so it maybe drives something. It's almost the idea of, you know, um, you might already have a loaded gun in terms of sort of genetic makeup or kind of, re re uh, you know, relation to, relationship to trauma, but it's maybe the society that you're in that pulls the trigger. Um, and likewise for uh, young Benny with, with hearing voices, that actually in a world where he can communicate with, with objects but that's not seen as a problematic thing, he can live a perfectly happy life. In a world where that's deemed mentally, um, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a mental illness in some form, he is then a problem child, he is sent to facilities that make the issue worse potentially because he's treated as an outsider which leaves him only objects to talk to and it then becomes more of a thing. So I think there's a lot of really quite clever things going on in the background of this, particularly some of the meta ideas around um, if a book is telling you a story, we are obviously reading a book, whether we're listening to it or reading it. And there is a line quite near the end where Ruth Ezeki directly addresses that with someone saying, well, you know, you might be reading or listening to a book right now. And it's obviously quite weird because you are, of course, to, to, to read that line, you would have to be reading it, reading it or listening to it. And so I think there's something quite interesting and, and fun going on behind the scenes with this book. There's a lot to delve into and I, I can kind of see why it's getting some prize attention in that I think there are some quite interesting and fun intellectual points to dissect. The thing I will say is I don't, overall, I think as a book, I, I did really enjoy this. Um, I don't think it was, it was a full sort of five star read for me. I think at times it felt a bit I kind of, I think it could have been a little bit more streamlined and a bit more focused in to some of those points. I think at times it either hit you on the head with them or it um, just sort of did a lot of preamble to something that was going on. And I think actually it could have been better served being a little bit more streamlined. That said, I do think it was a really pleasant reading experience. And um, I, yeah, I, I, I took quite a lot from it, um, even if I, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a perfect read for me. I mean, what is a perfect read? But um, I think it, it plays with some quite fun ideas. And I liked the idea that the animism and sort of sc different schools of thought were being used to reevaluate our current society in, in, you know, in the UK or the US or Canada um, in a different light. Um, so that was, that was really good fun. And I'm now really keen to read other books both Ruth Ozeki because I hear that you know a few people have said sort of in comments about various other things before that um, they really like Ruth Ozeki but they maybe don't see this as her strongest book and that gives me quite a lot of hope because I think there's a lot of interesting stuff here and so I'm keen to see the rest. Anyway love to hear your thoughts I've been Bob the Booker. take care and speak to you all soon bye bye.